Hi, I'm Molly Barrows, and I've been reporting on some of the saltier stories that surface in Northwest Florida for more than 20 years. Welcome to my investigative series, Gulf Coast Confidential. Before I begin this next story, it's important you know a little bit about the place where it happened, Escambia County, Florida, where we live. The 200-year-old county is the state's oldest. It's perched on the tip of the Florida panhandle, bordered by Alabama to the north and west and the beautiful Gulf of Mexico to the south. Pensacola is the county seat and Florida's westernmost city. It has long been the biggest metropolitan area in that neck of the woods. The closest larger cities are Tallahassee, about 200 miles to the east, and Mobile, Alabama, about 60 miles to the west and not far from the state line. Known as the City of Five Flags, Pensacola has a long and colorful history. Over the centuries, it has been under the rule of many different governments. The Spanish, British, French, United States, and even the Confederacy have all flown flags over America's first settlement. Those flags still stand in the city as a reminder of Pensacola's cultural heritage, but the Confederacy's Stars and Bars flag was only recently replaced with the state flag. That happened about seven or eight years ago, and the decision was met with pushback from those who felt removing the stars and bars of the Confederacy was an insult to the city's historic heritage. Those same arguments were made when the city of Pensacola removed a Confederate monument in 2020 that stood in a prominent location near downtown Pensacola for nearly 130 years. That monument is now in storage while a lawsuit demanding it be restored to its former home plays out. The city has always been a cultural melting pot, influenced by the ever-changing flow of new people and populations who moved to the beautiful city of nearly 54,000 on the Gulf of Mexico. They come for any number of reasons, drawn by one of the area's many military bases or gorgeous sugar-white beaches, or the relatively affordable cost of living, at least it used to be. However, like many communities, there is a big gap between the haves and the have-nots, and poverty is a problem. The area relies heavily on the service industry, as well as state, county, and other government jobs. Good careers or educational opportunities, they can be hard to come by for people of any race, but especially for low-income minorities. Census records show Pensacola had once been predominantly black, but y'all, that was 120 years ago. Jim Crow laws, lynchings, gerrymandering, and other power grabs forced black home and business owners out. And over the past century, conservative, scrappy, and white male-dominated leadership has traditionally characterized most of Florida panhandle politics. There were even race riots at Pensacola's Escambia High School as recently as the 1970s over desegregation and the school's Confederate mascot. While progress has been made, it has been an uphill battle. And as recently as 2020, a quality of life survey showed residents believe systemic racism is alive and well in Escambia County, particularly in regard to social injustice. This is the city, environment, and culture into which Willie Jr., Escambia County's first black commissioner in more than 100 years, was born and raised. With this in mind, you might can see why so many people still have questions about the government corruption scandal that broke in 2001 involving Willie Jr., a scandal that was a whopper even for politically scandalous Florida. It had all the necessary ingredients for a classic Southern-style dish of political intrigue, including a stew of characters, a heavy helping of shady backroom business deals, and more than a dash of drama. The details were so saucy, some folks around town joked that you can't spell a scambia without scam. Even the governor stepped in, and four Escambia County commissioners were removed from office, charged, and taken to jail. Tragically, Willie Jr. lost his life. The county's only black commissioner at the time disappeared the day before he was to be sentenced for his role in that corruption scandal. When his body turned up under a house a month later, it caused quite a stir, especially when his death was ruled a suicide. Many people still find that conclusion hard to swallow and to this day are hungry for answers. Here's Recipe for a Scandal. I'm investigative journalist Molly Barrows. For years, I've covered the stories that made headlines in Northwest Florida and all along the Gulf Coast. Murders. Missing persons. And mysteries of all kinds. These cases are far from over for many victims because the full story has yet to surface. Join me for Gulf Coast Confidential, where I dive into the saltier side of the South. 
and expose the lies, greed, and corruption that often weighs down the truth. It's time to turn the tide and get a shot at justice. You don't become the first black man in a century to serve on the Board of County Commissioners in the state of Florida's oldest county without being able to bridge the racial divide. Willie Jr. was known as a guy who could get things done. When his primarily minority constituents had a problem, he got it fixed and fast. No small feat in a city that had been segregated for most of Junior's growing up years. He was from Pensacola, born in 1942. And even his last name, Junior, is a reminder that his family had descended from those who had been enslaved. It's the surname they took instead of the last name of their slave master. Willie Jr. joined the U.S. Army and served two years before he was honorably discharged. He then enrolled at the University of West Florida, where he started the first black student union. He wasn't actually particularly involved in civil rights issues, but he was a natural politician and was almost always available to someone who needed help. He was known as the cheese man even before he was elected because he gave out free food through his job at a local nonprofit that helped those trying to make ends meet. Then regional director of the NAACP for Northwest Florida, Sabu Williams, told reporters at the time of Junior's 2004 disappearance, quote, he listened to people, touched them, and felt them. People just thought he was an honest person, end quote. The fact that Junior was in office at all was the result of legal action. He won the commission seat in 1983, several years after a group of local African Americans and the NAACP successfully sued to replace countywide commission races with single member districts to improve the chances of a black person being elected. Junior wasn't part of that lawsuit, but he certainly benefited from it. He was so popular, he easily won re-election and remained in District 3 for almost 20 years. During that time, he also fulfilled his dream of becoming a funeral director, a job he had actually wanted since he was a boy after realizing the local funeral director was the wealthiest black man in town. Willie ran Junior Funeral Home, famous for its so-called drive through mortuary. The business was near downtown Pensacola in an old brick building that had once been a church. Mourners, in fact, could circle back around and view the deceased through a window, sort of like a modified fast food restaurant, but bigger, without ever even having to leave their cars. Like the funeral director he admired from his youth, Junior also drove expensive cars and he had nice suits. It's interesting that a man who ran a business related to death would later have such a controversial one. Willie Jr. irks some in the minority community over his refusal to get behind certain civil rights issues, like renaming the downtown street his business was on after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., or even taking a stand on the death of a black man who had been killed by a local sheriff's deputy. However, he was often generous, like giving free funerals to the poor. Although usually caring and responsive to his constituents, Junior was also known for his lavish playboy lifestyle. He was married with a daughter, but he had numerous girlfriends that he showered with expensive gifts like cars, clothes, and furniture. One woman would later testify that Junior got her a job with the county, but he fired her after their affair ended. Junior looked and acted the part of the successful businessman, leasing Corvettes, dressing to the nines, and often traveling to see sporting events. But he was bogged down by enormous debt. Some of those free funerals he provided were actually illegally funded with money from prepaid funeral deposits. He got by on loans that he didn't always pay back, a position that left him financially and politically vulnerable. In 2000, there was something of a shakeup with the Escambia Board of County Commissioners. The Panhandle's longtime state senator and former Senate president, Wyan Dale Childers, better known as WD, had returned to Pensacola. Recently passed state term limits ended the powerful politician's 30-year run in the legislature, where he was known as the Banty Rooster. Short on stature but big on bravado, Childers and his salty, savvy ways brought home the bacon for Northwest Florida in a way few had ever done. The folksy, cash-carrying car salesman funneled millions of dollars to Florida's westernmost county, a part of the state that often feels treated like the legislature's redheaded stepchild for projects that made a lasting impact and significantly improved the community. Those projects included expanding the local interstate system, supporting the National Naval Aviation Museum aboard NAS Pensacola, and building the Pensacola Civic Center, now known as the Pensacola Bay Center. In the 1990s, Junior had even proposed naming the Civic Center after WD, a move that failed but was seen by some in the black community as currying favor with him. Once he was back at home, Childers ran for and won a seat on the Escambia County Board, intent on returning to the state capitol once again as an elected representative once his commission term ended. 
However, switching gears from such a powerful position in Tallahassee to running county business at home quickly took a toll on Escambia County's status quo. Within a year and a half of Childers taking office, there was an exodus of staff. Six people left, including the county administrator, parks and recreation director, county attorney, and many blame Childers' bold, brash, bulldozing leadership style for the reasons that they all left. Former Escambia County Public Safety Director Janice Kilgore remembers what it was like working for the county during that time. She said, quote, it was very hard to be a county department head during WD's tenure. If you said something he didn't like, he would belittle that person and get them fired. So much going on behind closed doors. Willie Jr. told me there was nothing he could do to help as WD was too powerful. Thankfully, former state attorney Curtis Golden and his team stopped all this. Power is a terrible thing for some people, end quote. Childers was cock of the walk when it came to county business. He organized a voting block with commissioners Willie Jr. and Mike Bass that was able to pass any motion over the opposition of the other two commissioners. Childers got used to having his way in the kitchen, and that's when they got to cooking up some controversy. On October 4, 2001, Commissioner Willie Jr. proposed an add-on to the commission agenda. The motion was to negotiate a price to buy the Pensacola Soccer Complex, a large piece of property north of Pensacola that had failed to become the bustling sports mecca it was designed to be. The motion was unanimously approved, and several weeks later, the commission agreed to spend almost $4 million in local option sales tax funds to buy it. The deal was done by the end of the month. Two months later, in January of 2002, Junior made another add-on motion to buy an old car dealership for $2.3 million, which was also approved. Childers' voting bloc, including himself, Junior, and Bass, managed to push through both motions. There was no public discussion, and both properties were owned by Pensacola real estate agent Joe Elliott and his wife, Georgianne, both friends of Childers. However, the spending did not go unnoticed. Reporters for the Pensacola News Journal started digging, asking questions, and reporting on these questionable deals. By February, then-District 1 State Attorney Curtis Golden was investigating the sketchy land purchases, but the probe didn't stop there. Turns out trouble had been bubbling beneath the surface of Escambia County politics for some time and was about to boil over. Golden's inquiry led to charges that county commissioners were meeting in secret to discuss all sorts of public business, including county building contracts, the landfill, and creating new voting districts. Some of these conversations happened over lunches of country-fried venison and Whataburger. Golden filed a slew of felony charges against the commissioners, including bribery, racketeering, money laundering, extortion, and grand theft. Some of those charges stem from alleged bribes surrounding the two county land deals. Others indicated that Escambia commissioners traded votes for cash and favors from local developers, engineers, and even real estate agents. In testimony before a grand jury, Childers revealed he had written around $90,000 in checks to Commissioner Jr., but insisted they were quote-unquote loans. By April of 2002, four commissioners were booked into the Escambia County Jail on more than two dozen charges, including bribery, racketeering, and violating the state sunshine law. Governor Jeb Bush at the time suspended the four indicted commissioners, W.D. Childers, Willie Jr., Mike Bass, and Commissioner Terry Smith. Childers and Smith had called then-Escambia County Election Supervisor Bonnie Jones at her home and told her where they wanted new county commission voting district lines drawn. Childers was charged with additional counts of money laundering and bribery, but was released from jail on $50,000 bond. He was later convicted of bribery and unlawful compensation, as well as violating Sunshine Law over that call he and Smith made to Jones about redistricting. Junior pleaded no contest to 10 felony charges and one misdemeanor charge relating to other misdeeds committed during his tenure. Facing 125 years in prison, he agreed to testify against Childers in exchange for a reduced sentence of no more than 18 months in prison. At WD's trial, Junior testified that the former Senate president had given him around $90,000 in cash stuffed in a what? A stainless steel collard greens pot, all in exchange for his cooperation in getting those land deals done. He received the money after the county closed on the property. And he also claimed that realtor Joe Elliott personally gave him another 10 grand the day before the vote to buy the soccer complex property. The Elliotts made more than $560,000 off that deal since the county bought it for more than the couple paid for it. State prosecutors say they kicked 200,000 of those dollars back to Childers, who then gave Junior almost half of it. Ultimately, Joe and Georgia and Elliott were acquitted of all charges, but based on Junior's testimony, WD was found guilty of two charges of bribery and unlawful compensation. 
In response to the trial's outcome, Pensacola's favorite celebrity trial attorney, Fred Levin, whose legal acumen enabled the state of Florida to successfully sue Big Tobacco for billions over medical expenses for smoking-related illnesses in the 1990s, well, he called Junior a quote-unquote rat fink for testifying against the panhandle politician, W.D. Childers. The Florida Bar took Levin to task over that comment, but Levin was a longtime friend and attorney for Childers. The politician had been instrumental in passing that Medicaid law Levin had rewritten, the one that opened the door for the state to pursue their case against the tobacco industry. And that was a legal move that was subsequently modeled and pursued by dozens of other states. It appears Junior, though, was also stressed over having to testify against Childers. Two months before Childers' trial, Junior was found unconscious and taken to a hospital. A doctor said he had likely had a reaction to medication for anxiety and depression, but he had kept his end of the prosecutorial bargain and was himself to be sentenced in November of 2004 for his role in the scandal. The only thing is, he never showed up to court. Investigators with the state attorney's office and the FBI started searching for the missing commissioner when he was a no-show for his criminal sentencing hearing at the Escambia County Courthouse on November 10, 2004. The courtroom had been packed with junior supporters, as well as other onlookers fascinated by the ongoing political drama. Retired college professor Elmer Jenkins was scheduled to be the first speaker that day. Jenkins later told the Tampa Bay Times, quote, Junior would have been on that board as long as he wanted to. People still believed in him, end quote. From coffee shops and courtrooms to homes, hair salons, and office water coolers, Willie Jr.'s disappearance was the talk of the town. What could have become of the beleaguered politician? Did he run to keep from going to jail? Did someone help him disappear? Where was Willie Jr.? Questions kept coming until finally there was an answer. But that discovery only added to the mystery. On December 9th, 2004, a man called police because he had been noticing a terrible smell coming from the house of his elderly next door neighbor on East Strong Street in Pensacola's neighborhood of East Hill. That smell was not going away, and he suspected the stench was from a dead body. He was not wrong. Pensacola police detective Jason Hendricks in his report said, quote, Harvey Mullen, Benjamin Dudley's neighbor at 1004 East Strong, said that he had been smelling an odor for about a week, which he thought could be a dead body under Dudley's house, end quote. Hendricks continued saying, quote, Dudley said he had not smelled it until today and discovered some Heineken beer bottles under the west side of his house. Dudley said he did not go under the house, but just reached in and grabbed the beer bottles to throw away. Cadet Perkins and I both looked under the house from the east side and saw what appeared to be a body. We removed a board on the bottom east side of the house for a better view and did see a body and could also smell a strong odor, end quote. The body was lying face up in the crawl space underneath the house and was badly decomposed. Insects were everywhere and all officers knew for sure at the time is that the body was that of an unidentified male. They called in crime scene and the medical examiner's office, who also sent an investigator to work the scene. They documented and collected evidence, but they could find no identification on the man's body. The following is some of the evidence police did collect from the scene. Quote, upper dentures were collected just west of the upper torso of the body. Right shoe was collected just southwest of the lower torso of the body. White sheet was collected just east of the body. White plastic Circle K bag was pulled from the southwest corner of the house by B. Dudley, the homeowner. A Heineken beer bottle located inside. Two Heineken beer bottles empty located inside. Whataburger cup empty located inside. White bottle opener located inside. White plastic golden to-go bag was collected on the west side of the house. Yellow colored liquid located inside later identified as human urine. The body was taken to the medical examiner's office for autopsy. The doctor examined the remains and found no signs of injuries or fractures on the partially mummified scalp and skull. According to the report, there was no indication of injuries anywhere on the decomposed body. However, when then Chief Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Andrea Minyard closely examined his kidney, she found, quote, widespread refractal material consistent with ethylene glycol crystals, end quote, or antifreeze. She also found evidence of it in his liver. Her diagnosis was ethylene glycol poisoning. During the autopsy, investigators also logged the evidence they found on him, including his clothes and items he was carrying. They are listed as, quote, $60.76 in U.S. currency from the victim's left front pants pocket, three pieces of cream savers candy from the victim's left front pants pocket, 
dryer sheet from the victim's left front pants pocket. Quote, the victim was wearing a gray turtleneck shirt, black and white houndstooth pants, police reported. South Glazebrook collected postmortem fingerprints from the victim. At the conclusion of the autopsy, Dr. Minyard advised that there were no signs of foul play and that the results of the autopsy were pending further toxicological analysis, end quote. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement also tested his urine for a variety of drugs, including barbiturates, cannabinoids, cocaine, metabolite, methadone, opioids, etc. No drugs were identified, according to that report. Although Junior was officially identified using his dental records, his wife confirmed to police that he had been wearing those same clothes found on the body under the house when he disappeared. Based on the evidence, state and federal investigators put together a timeline of Willie Jr.'s last day, and Pensacola police included it in their report. It is as follows. Around 10 in the morning, Jr. left his home and went and got his hair cut. Later that morning, he was seen walking south between 12th Avenue and Hatton Street by another police officer. He then arrives at the hair salon to get his hair cut. Around 6.30, Willie Jr. called a friend and spoke with her for about 2 minutes and 41 seconds. At 7.30 that evening, Willie Jr. left a friend's home carrying Heineken beer in a six-pack container inside a white plastic bag along with a bottle opener, and he walks to the corner of Alconese and Jackson Street and turns east on Jackson Street. A few minutes later, he returns to his friend's house and asks him for a white sheet. Bryant gave him a sheet. He then asked Willie Jr. about calling him a taxi. Jr. stated to him he was going on in and he didn't need a ride, but if he needed a ride, he would let him know and he'd see him later. Willie Jr. left again, and this was the last time anyone saw Willie Jr. alive. On November 10, 2004, Willie Jr. was scheduled to appear for sentencing, but he did not. On December 9th, Willie Jr.'s body was found underneath the home of Benjamin Dudley on Strong Street. Police say the owner of that home where Willie was found, 89-year-old Benjamin Dudley, knew the commissioner that he used to work for Jr. at his funeral home. He said he had last seen him after Hurricane Ivan, which had hit the Pensacola area hard about six weeks earlier. Dudley told them Willie Jr. and his wife came by to check on him in the wake of the powerful storm. Police also included in their report on Willie Jr. what they called a quote-unquote suspicious circumstance involving the commissioner that was reported to them on February 4, 2003, not long before Jr. testified at W.D. Childers' trial. His wife had gone to wake him up, but she couldn't rouse him. According to the report, she found, quote, a bottle of pills lying next to the bed on the floor. There was a six-pack of Remeron on the dresser and five pills were missing from the pack, end quote. Police go on to say that at the time of the incident, Junior was not complaining of any illness, but he had been very stressed and mildly depressed over the ongoing criminal investigation into the Escambia Board of County Commissioners. Zyprexa is prescribed for the management of psychotic disorders, and Remeron is prescribed for depression. Detectives describe Junior's symptoms as being consistent with an overdose of those two drugs. Police stated, quote, Junior was found unconscious and unresponsive to pain stimuli and was making a gurgling sound when breathing and had an elevated heart rate, end quote. Due to doctor-patient privilege, they were unable to learn the cause of Junior's quote-unquote sudden illness that day in February, but they do not believe that foul play was involved. However, they do believe they know what killed him, and that was ethylene glycol poisoning. One of the Heineken beer bottles found at the scene was submitted to the Bureau of Forensic Fire and Explosives Analysts. The test results revealed that it was ethylene glycol, the active ingredient in most automobile antifreeze. They went back to Benjamin Dudley's house to see if they could find the source of that antifreeze, but they didn't find any on Dudley's property. They did find he had an open shed which had a number of other chemicals, including a Texaco antifreeze container, but they said it didn't actually even have any antifreeze in it, but some other unknown liquid. The police report concluded, quote, after a review of the totality of the circumstances and a review of Willie Jr.'s medical re records by the medical examiner's office and the fact that the autopsy results were consistent with ethylene glycol poisoning, the manner of death was ruled a suicide. End quote. At the time his body was discovered, and even now, 20 years later, many in the community still debate how 62-year-old Willie Jr. died. He didn't leave a suicide note. And considering the circumstances surrounding the investigation, some speculated that perhaps Jr. had been forced or somehow persuaded to drink antifreeze. After all, it was his testimony that sent W.D. Childers to prison, and without that, it's unlikely the Banny Rooster would have been convicted. Barber Charmaine Jordan cut Junior's hair on the day he was last seen alive. He told reporters at the time, quote, How many people you know go get a haircut, then go lay down and die? 
Willie Jr. was the type that every time you saw him, he was dressed up. Willie ain't going up under no house like a dog, end quote. W.D. Childers was in the process of appealing his conviction when Jr. died, which some could consider helpful to his case. In fact, state appellate court judges argued over whether Childers' conviction should be overturned. Initially, one panel of judges voted to reverse the conviction on the grounds that Childers didn't have enough opportunity to cross-examine Jr., but the superseding decision of the court was to uphold the conviction. The discussion is documented in Childers versus the state of Florida and includes 10 separate opinions from the appellate, something unheard of then. One of the judges on the original panel that wanted to overturn Childers' conviction, Judge Charles J. Kahn, had been a former law partner with Fred Levin and other members of the court were concerned those close ties would give the public the impression that Childers was somehow getting special treatment because Childers and Levin were friends. Several articles from major Florida newspapers were included in the opinions, which included information about the connections between Childers and Levin, as well as Governor Lawton Childs and other influential movers and shakers in the state. The court wrote in the 2006 decision, quote, The majority opinion authored by Judge Kahn proposed to reverse Mr. Childers' convictions based upon the argument that Mr. Childers had been denied an adequate opportunity to cross-examine Mr. Jr., a dissenting judge disagreed. Accordingly, if this panel decision had stood, Mr. Childers' convictions would have been reversed on grounds making retrial unlikely, thus likely extricating Mr. Childers from what the June 23, 2002 St. Petersburg Times article called, quote, the most serious predicament of his political career, and the deciding vote on this decision would have been cast by Fred Levin's former law partner. Less suspicious members of the public, familiar with the information contained in the articles quoted above and also familiar with Judge Kahn's former association with Mr. Levin and his firm, would have found it inappropriate for Judge Kahn to have participated in the case, and more suspicious members of the public would have assumed that Judge Kahn had simply returned past favors provided to him by Mr. Levin and Mr. Childers, thus allowing them once again to, quote, snooker the bastards, end quote. Snooker the Bastards was a reference to a line in one of the newspaper articles. In 2010, a federal appeals court did overturn Childers' bribery conviction on the grounds that he had been denied his constitutional rights to confront his accuser since the defense team wasn't allowed to question Junior on his change in testimony. However, the bribery conviction was reinstated in 2011 by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which resulted in denying the former state senator his state retirement. W.D. Childers was already out of custody by the time the federal decisions were reached. After serving nearly three years of a 42-month-long prison sentence in West Palm Beach, he was released in June of 2009 and moved away from Pensacola. Childers has family in Lake Worth, Florida, and news reports and his wife's obituary from last year indicate that's where the 89-year-old man now lives. Friends and acquaintances believe the scandal knocked the once powerful politician back on his heels and that incarceration took a heavy toll on his health. Back in Pensacola, people remember Willie Jr. too, and the whole cast of political good old boy type characters who were involved in this far reaching scandal. While some question if Jr. really committed suicide, others don't find it hard to believe. At the time he died, Jr. had lost his job, his position in the community his funeral home business, and he was about $300,000 in debt. For the man who was the man around town for many years, especially to the minority community, he had had a long, hard fall, one from which he was struggling to recover. Fred Levin had also known Junior for years and at one point had considered him a friend. He told the press at the time, quote, everything had gone wrong for him. He was living at the very top and now all of a sudden he was destitute, end quote. Regardless of how he died, some in the black community say what's not up for debate is the help Junior gave many people and that he broke ground as a black man in county government, a position some say may have also led to his downfall. Quote, unquote, greed got in my way, Willie Jr. told Leroy Boyd at the time, who was president of the grassroots civil rights organization Movement for Change in Pensacola. Quote, some people were totally disgusted with Willie Jr. for having that much trust in a white person, Leroy Boyd said at the time. He should have known better, end quote. When I posted this story on my blog, the debate continued with one reader commenting, quote, this was too much then and it's too much now. Thank you, Molly, for outlining all the events that led up to what is still a mystery in many of our minds. This community lost a good one who cared nothing about district lines and assisted not only his constituents, but those who were in other areas when he could. There's no one in the world without faults. And Mr. Jr. made mistakes, but he did not deserve this ending, end quote.
When Junior died, Benjamin Dudley said what many who knew and appreciated him thought. You just don't really know what's going on in someone else's mind and heart. Quote, I look at it from this standpoint. When you have problems, problems mounted on top of problems, you might do anything, Dudley said. Only Mr. Junior and the good master know what happened, and we can't get in touch with either one. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Gulf Coast Confidential, Recipe for a Scandal. I'm your host, writer, and producer, Molly Barrows. And thanks to director, editor, and production engineer, James Roy. You can listen to more Gulf Coast Confidential wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And you can also watch on the Gulf Coast Confidential YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.